Um, hi, Professor John. Um, I have a question about the paper. Uh, okay. Infectious disease. So, uh, mm -hmm. is it APA format? Can you state that again? I'm not hearing you too well. Is it, uh, are, are we using the APA format? Uh, yeah, you should use uh, AP format to give your citations. Although if you use ML format, or is it MLA format, whatever, uh, either one will be fine. Oh, that's just for citations? That's for citations and references, in-text citations and references. Uh, because I, I was a little confused because I know APA format, you have to use uh, double spacing, but um, you specify we use single spacing. Uh, yeah, follow the directions that I give there. I'm not sure uh, how AP formatting is, but if in my instructions I say use single space, uh, use single space. Uh, let me review something for you. An in-text citation you put inside your text, inside your your article. Yes. Is that clear? Yes. And that's when you give an important fact, something that's not generally known, or maybe you're quoting someone, something like that. Okay? What you do is you give the author's, uh, sorry, you give the author's last name. So you have the, let, let's make this a space here. Uh, you give the author's last name in parentheses. Come on. And then you go a comma and then the year and then parentheses. So that's all it is. If it's two authors, you give both last names like Smith and Jones, 2020. If it's more than two authors, you give the first author's last name and then you go at all. So in that case, it would be Smith at all, and then go a comma, and then the year. Is that clear? That's all an in-text yeah. citation is. And then at the end of your paper, you have a references, and these are your full citations. It should list all of the references you gave as an in-text citation, and perhaps more. Um, so we would have Smith, and here you'd have to give uh, his initials, and then you give everybody else, we'll say Jones, and what would be another name? Uh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, a, A, and, uh, and then we're going to make a third author. I'm going to say Black, uh, J, and then you give the name, to, or the year, 2020. And, and there's a format for doing that. Normally you go the article's name, uh, the journal, uh, the volume number of the journal and the page number. And that's for a, a scientific article and a publication. It would be different for a, a book and it would be different for a web page. If it's a web page, instead of giving the journal, the volume number and the page number, you give the web page address. Okay, yes. you should have learned this in your uh, tutorial on, uh, uh, what is that called, on, on uh, plagiarism, the plagiarism tutorial. Yeah, I know about this. And, okay. you, and you want us to, hand, to write five pages. Uh-huh, oh. just follow the directions. All Professor, right. I have a question since he was on that. If you're looking at something from CDC, for example, and there's not an author's name, but there's an editor's name, can you write that? 
and so the editor's name. Yeah, give the editor's name. If yeah. you're on a page and it's not stating who the author is, sometimes it's really hard to find out. Like, uh, you can go, let me see if I can remember how to do this. Uh, page source. Anyone know how to do that in this? I might be able to Google how to figure out how to find the website, but I, I when I was looking at one of the um, scientific I don't see websites. a page source here. Uh, I'll go to go to another browser. There's a way to get it, but I'm sure not seeing it. Uh, you might have to go into the page source to get that information. And um, let me open up another browser. I assume you guys are getting this, seeing this. I'm using Chrome, and I right-clicked, and it would show me the page source. Okay, great. Um, I don't have an option here, so... Uh, they've changed this one, too. Anyways, um, do that. I'm trying to get to Chrome. Actually, we won't need that. Trouble is, I'm not sure what's going to open up here. It might be a blank screen. Ah. Yep. Um, let's go to Clark. And so you right click on the page or up on the top? On the page itself. I don't have it on mine, but there is a way to get the uh, source. And it used to be that it was up in the, uh, it was up in here. Maybe it's this one. No, that's not it. Anyways, uh, you might have to go to the page source. There are a couple of other things you can do to look for the author. But if you have an editor, that's fine. Uh, sometimes, when you go to a web page, there will be a link going to about, meaning it takes you to a page about the website, and it might give you the author in the about page. Just okay. do your best. And the, uh, the uh, tutorial did tell you how to give a citation if there is no author. Okay, okay thank you, Professor. All right. So let's get on with our lesson. We're doing chapter eight today, microbial genetics. There is no lab today, but do finish lab eight. You should be working on your unknown project, and you should also be working on your infectious disease paper, and that paper is due at 11.59 p.m. this Saturday, November 7th. Any questions about any of that? Uh, real quick about the lab. Yeah. Uh, my computer is saying that that file is temporarily locked because I tried downloading it. Which file? The, the lab file, the Word document. Yeah, I had the same problem and it's the one that explains everything. That's the only file we can't open, not the worksheet, just the information. Oh, see, I couldn't, I couldn't even open the worksheet one that we turn in. Yeah, I can't. Let me take a look here. This will take me a few minutes. I remember that I put the uh, document up there, and you're seeing it, but you can't open it. That's really strange. I didn't even know Canvas had that. It it looks like it normally does, and then when you click on the link uh, to download it, it just says it's unavailable. That would be difficult if you didn't go through my uh, discussion of the lab. So this link is the one that's a problem? No, I can, 
I can open that part, but I can't open the work the worksheet lab when I click on the worksheet lab eight. It won't let me download it. It'll go to the page like normal, but it'll go to the page. So you can see this. Yes, and then when and then I click, click on that on this link. Yeah, and then it says it's unavailable. Yeah, I just tried it right now and it was definitely the worksheet. It says unlocked and it won't let you download it to fill it out. Hmm, I'm getting it. I'm not sure why you guys are having a trouble. This is it right here. Um, there's nothing specific about that. There's no control in there. Um, yeah, the exact works. The word, the exact words it says is this file is locked. I just downloaded the PDF file and printed that out, and then just started filling it out by hand. Uh huh. Just a second. You're talking about you downloaded the lab itself. Um, let me look into the files and see if there's something strange about it. You guys never see this. I can't read it. I don't know if that's it or that's it. Uh, let's publish that. Come on. I just tried logging in on my See if it'll work in. now. I don't know if that was it, but uh, that one wasn't published, and I don't know why it wasn't published. I think yeah, it's working it, now. Yeah, yep. it just worked that me worked. too. That worked. All right, that solved the problem. Um, I don't even know why that wasn't published. It was downloaded and it should have been published. But anyways, uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, let's go back to the modules. All right, let's, let's go into what we're doing today. Let's close that. All right, so we were talking about protein translation, and this was the last slide that I had discussed. Any questions about that? If not, let's continue talking about protein translation. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what we saw in the movie in greater detail. Uh, for your uh, recall, protein and translation is when the message in the messenger RNA is translated to protein. So in the flow of DNA, the information in DNA goes to messenger RNA, which goes to protein. Uh, translation begins when the messenger RNA enters the cytoplasm and by the way, for prokaryotes, that happens immediately. As soon as the messenger RNA is made, it is already in the cytoplasm. And then the ribosomal units, there are two of them, combine on the messenger RNA, and then the tRNA comes in. So the ribosomes are made up of our RNA. The tRNA is, of course, made of tRNA, and the messenger RNA is made of messenger RNA. And so all the forms of RNA are involved in protein translation. And remember the ribosomes also have ribosomal proteins. Uh, the ribosomes have two spots in them, which you can call them holes or whatever channels, for the tRNA to come in and then bind to the messenger RNA. 
It's actually the tRNA that reads the messenger RNA, and that's because the uh, codons like AUG will only be read by a tRNA that has the anti-codon. Is that shown here? It's shown here. Uh, meaning that if it's AUG in the codon, the anticodon is going to be the corollary to that, and that is U binds with A, A binds with U, and C binds with G. Is that clear? Now, we do say all the time that the ribosome reads the messenger RNA, and by that we mean that it gets on the messenger RNA and then puts its uh, channel in the messenger RNA and then allows the correct tRNA to come in. But in reality, the ribosome is just moving down the messenger RNA. It's the tRNA which is reading the messenger RNA and then translating it and bringing in the correct amino acid. So AUG codes for methionine, and that's because the tRNA that has the anticodon, A, excuse me, U, A, C, has the amino acid methionine. So the tRNA reads the messenger RNA and then brings in the correct amino acid. Any questions about that? So the first tRNA comes to the first slot in the ribosome and then binds to the messenger RNA. And the binding is only by hydrogen bonds, meaning the anticodon binds to the codon by hydrogen bonds. Any questions about any of that? And then the second tRNA comes in the second spot in the ribosome and its anticodon binds to the codon in the second position in the ribosome. And that is how the amino acids are brought, um, brought in to translate the protein and how the codons are read, I guess. Then the amino acid from the first tRNA is removed from the tRNA and it's bonded to the second amino acid by a peptide bond. And so this now will be a polypeptide, or a real short one, because polypeptide is really more than two amino acids. But that's how the amino acids uh, get attached to a growing protein. Any questions about that? Um, in this slide, it's telling you the names of the channels in the ribosome. You don't need to know that one's called the P site, one's called the A site. Um, but you should know that the amino acids are removed from the tRNA the first tRNA and then bound to a covalent bond to the uh, second amino acid. And that's how the polypeptide grows and will eventually form the protein. Now something that I'm not going to quiz you on, but it's just uh, uh, fun for your information, and that is the enzyme or the enzymatic activity that removes the amino acid from the tRNA and then binds the uh, amino acid to the first amino acid to the second amino acid. The enzyme that does that is actually an RNA enzyme which the book calls the ribosome. ribozyme. Okay, it's the only RNA enzyme that we will ever discuss and so that's why I just wanted to mention it. Any questions about any of that? All right, 
then the first tRNA falls out of the the ribosome, ribosome and it's probably because it doesn't have an amino acid attached to it and so it's um, folding pattern changes and then it comes out of the ribosome. Uh, and then another tRNA which will be the third comes near the ribosome but it can't do anything yet because it's not in position but once the tRNA comes out of the ribosome, meaning the first tRNA comes out of the the ribosome, the ribosome then moves in position and moves down one codon. So instead of having the first and the second codons under the ribosome, it'll now be the second and the third codons under the ribosome, which is shown here. The ribosome moves along the messenger RNA, moving down the messenger RNA. And so the ribosome now is at the second and third codons. And then the tRNA for the third codon can come in, bringing the correct amino acid. And then in like story, the amino acid from the second tRNA is removed from the tRNA and, and attached to the third amino acid and the protein polypeptide grows to start forming the uh, growing protein. Any questions about any of that? So in like mind, the free tRNA falls out of the uh, ribosome and the uh, um, growing polypeptide attaches to the new uh, amino acid and in this one it's methionine so we have AUG again and uh, th this way is how the growing polypeptide uh, grows uh, which will eventually keep adding amino acids and become the protein and I guess I need to come back to this slide at the very beginning so a uh, protein always has its start methionine because AUG is the start codon and that is where the ribosome adds the first amino acid. The ribosome does read the codons upstream of AUG but it doesn't do anything with it. It just keeps moving down until it comes to AUG. Is that clear to everyone? Yes. So it doesn't pro translate or add on the amino acids to a codon up above AUG. The first codon will be AUG, which is the start codon. And if the protein doesn't want the amino acid methionine to be the start of the protein, after the protein is made, it'll remove that methionine. It just cuts it off. And then the next amino acid will be the start of the uh, protein. Any questions about any of that? Okay, the point is all proteins, when they're first growing, they always start with, with methionine because that's the start codon. And that start codon does two things. It tells the ribosome start here and it also uh, brings in the first amino acid which is methionine. And so the ribosome moves down the messenger RNA adding in more amino acids which are brought in by the correct tRNA. And that process continues until the ribosome moves to a stop codon. One of the stop codons is UGA. I'm not going to require you to remember the codons that code for stop. But once the ribosome reaches a stop codon, it stops protein translation. Once it reaches uh, a stop codon, 
the ribosome actually falls apart, falls off the messenger RNA, the tRNA is released, and the protein, which is now a protein because all the amino acids have been added, the protein is released from the ribosome. Any questions about any of that? If there's no questions, let's uh, mention that there's a complication in prokaryotes. Uh, in eukaryotes, this complication doesn't happen because transcription of the DNA happens in the nucleus but translation happens outside the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. Okay? Everyone clear on that? I only told you what happens. Uh, the complication with prokaryotes is uh, that the polymerase when it's making the RNA, the messenger RNA, uh, there can be more than one polymerase. And as you can see from this electro, electro microscopic image, that there's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight polymerases on this gene, transcribing it, making at least eight messenger RNAs. And that can happen in a eukaryote, where one gene can have more than one polymerase in it, and the polymerases are moving that way, and that's why the longer messenger RNAs are on this side, and they get shorter as you go down this way. And this is an artist's rendition of it down here, but that's an actual picture of it. Okay? And this complication happens in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. But in prokaryotes, there's an additional complication. And that is protein translation can happen on the messenger RNA before the messenger RNA is completed. Meaning while transcription is occurring, protein translation can happen in a prokaryote. And why is that? Somebody hopefully can answer. Anyone want to guess? Well, protein translation can happen before transcription finishes because in a prokaryote, this is all happening in the cytoplasm. And so when we have the messenger RNA here, which is still being transcribed, the ribosomes can bind to it and start translating the messenger RNA. Is that clear? In prokaryotes, you can have protein translation happening before transcription finishes. And this is trying to show you it in a really, really bad way. It's not showing you the, the protein, but there's the DNA, which you can sort of see right there. And then these blue things are the polymerases, which might be that big thing there and there and there. And the polymerases are going that way, and as you go down further, it's a longer messenger RNA, which is sort of that line there, which you can sort of see. And let me see if I can blow this up. You can see it here, but it's really faint. It's that blue line going down there. That's the messenger RNA, and it's longer for here, than here, than here, than here. And then these red things are ribosomes binding to the messenger RNA. And there they are uh, translating this messenger RNA and they're moving this way down the messenger RNA, meaning this is the start of the messenger RNA. And as you can see, there's more than one ribosome on the messenger RNA. But the complication is, is that uh, 
in prokaryotes, you can have protein translation occurring before transcription has finished. And this is not showing you the protein. Okay, just showing you the ribosome. Any questions there? Kind of complicated, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. There's another complication that doesn't happen in eukaryotes, but it does happen in prokaryotes. And that is uh, before the messenger RNA comes out of the nucleus, it is, uh, what's the word, uh, processed. And that's because in eukaryotes, when we transcribe the messenger RNA, not all of the regions of DNA code for the, press, the protein. And the regions of the gene that code for the protein, we call exons. Introns are region of the gene that do not code for protein. And when the RNA is transcribed, it will transcribe both the exons and the introns. And the introns, the regions of the messenger RNA that don't code for proteins, the term is spliced out. It means cut. So this intron will be cut out, and this one too. And then these exons will be spliced together, joined together. And the uh, initial RNA transcript is processed. And only the processed RNA transcript uh, is allowed to leave the nucleus, meaning the pores in the nucleus allow the processed messenger RNA to leave, but they do not allow the RNA transcripts that have introns in them to leave the, the uh, nucleus. Any question there? Now in bacteria, the genes do not have introns in them. And then there can be no processing because uh, the DNA is in the cytoplasm. And so when it's transcribed, it's immediately in the cytoplasm. And like I said, bacteria don't have introns, so that's not a problem anyways. But eukaryotes do, and there are vast regions of a gene. Uh, it's about 50% of most genes do not code for the protein. They are introns, and they have to be removed from the messenger RNA before the messenger RNA can be translated into a protein. All right, any questions about any of that? All right, so we've talked about the structure and function of the genetic material, talking about the flow of genetic information. We talked about DNA replication, RNA transcription, and protein translation. Now let's talk about the regulation uh, bacterial gene expression. This involves the operons, so we'll talk about the operons. And we will probably cover a little bit of mutation today. I think it's actually in your uh, worksheet for today's lecture. And we might... No, I think this will be talked about next time. Uh, genetic transfer and recombination, we'll talk about that and then move on to genes and evolution. Any questions about what we're doing? When we're talking about the regulation of a bacterial gene, there are different regu ways to regulate it. We're going to talk about control regulating it by controlling the expression of the gene. And we're going to talk about it in very simple terms where we'll say the gene is turned on, it's transcribed, 
or the gene is turned off, it is not transcribed. No products will be made from that gene. Now in reality, it's much more complex than that. You can have a gene that's transcribed just a little bit, transcribed a fair amount, transcribed a regular amount, transcribed a lot, and then transcribed a ton amount, meaning uh, uh, some genes will be transcribed, like maybe one messenger RNA transcript per hour or one per day. And then others, there will be many transcripts per hour. Any question about that? So gene expression is a little more complex than we're going to talk about it. I'm just going to talk about it in simple terms, saying the gene is turned on or the gene is turned off. For the genes that are turned on, if they're always turned on, we call them a constitutive gene, such as a constitutive enzyme, and that means in this cell, this enzyme is always made. It's expressed at a fixed rate. There's an old term for that. It's called the housekeeping genes, and these are the genes that the cell has to have on in order to survive and maintain itself. Any question about any of that? Other genes are only expressed when they are needed. And if the cell doesn't need them, why would it express it? because that would just be wasting energy. You're making the gene products for a gene that isn't needed. And bacteria don't like to do that, and so they'll turn that gene off if it's not needed. There are two ways to control gene expression in this regard, meaning turning it on or turning it off. There's repressible genes and those are ones that are uh, normally turned on, but they can be repressed and turned off when the gene isn't needed. And then there are inducible genes, and these genes are normally turned off, but when they are needed, the gene can be induced and turned on. Any questions about that? Hopefully you understood the difference. They're sort of the reverse of each other, but they are both turn on the gene when they're needed and turn it off when they're not. Regulation in this regard is pre-transcriptional, meaning the gene is turned on or off before it is transcribed. It can happen after transcription, and we got it down here. There are post-transcriptional controls. We're not going to talk about them, and you're not going to be held accountable. There are also epigenetic controls, which are really weird and, and confusing, and we're not going to even talk about that in this class, where a gene can be turned on or off, or some other mechanism regulating the gene, and it's not happening by a normal turning off or turning on. It's actually depending on what environment the cell is in and what the cell does. And we're not going to talk about that. We are going to talk about inducible genes, a gene that is normally turned off, but it can be induced to be turned on and we're going to look at the LAC operon. The, uh, the operon, we'll word it that way, that contains the lactase enzyme for um, metabolizing the sugar lactose. So we're going to look at that in great detail. And so we're going to talk about inducible genes. We're not going to talk about repressible operons 
they work similar to inducible uh, operoms, but they're just a little different. And if you wanted to, you could read about that, but I'm not going to test you on it. All right, any questions about this? Well, here's a question for you. Does it make sense for a cell to make a gene if the gene, the gene product, I should say, if the gene is not being used? No. Yes, the correct answer is no. It doesn't make sense to make a gene if it's not needed. And so cells turn those genes off. Now let's talk about the operon. An operon is a model for explaining gene expression. An operon contains a gene of interest, and that we call a structural gene. So the LAC operon contains the lactase gene. You hungry? Well, let's do Sorry. homework, buddy. Um, the lactase gene contains, the LAC operon contains the lactase gene, which converts the sugar lactose to... Uh, um, well, it converts the metabolizes the sugar lactose. Uh, eventually, converts it to the sugar glucose. Uh, all operons contain one or more structural genes, and normally, when we talk about a gene like the blue eye gene or the lactase gene, we're talking about a structural gene. Any question about that? A operon contains the structural gene and then the coding regions that control the expression of that structural gene. And an operon may contain, uh, at least a bacterial operon, may contain more than one structural gene. Uh, that differs from a eukaryote operon. A eukaryote operon only contains one structural gene. Uh, so in a sense, eukaryote operons are simpler, but they're actually more complex because there's many more ways to control the expression of a eukaryotic gene then there are ways to control the expression of a bacterial gene. So actually, uh, eukaryotic operons are more complex. The genetic regions that control the expression of the structural gene are regions near the structural gene that play a role in expressing that structural gene. And for bacterial operons, the two regions you need to know are the P site, which is where the promoter, the RNA polymerase, binds to the DNA. So the P site, which is the promoter, is where the RNA polymerase binds to the gene. So the promoter codes for the DNA to bind to the RNA polymerase. Any questions about that? The operator regulates the expression of the structural genes, and we'll talk about the operator in just a little bit. So the controlling regions and the structural genes make up the operon. I would like to say that the terminator, which uh, ends the transcription of the gene, is also part of the operon. And that an operon, what it is really, it's a super gene, meaning the LAC operon is a super gene containing the lactase gene, which is the Z gene, and any other genes involved in the 
metabolism of that structural gene. So the other genes involved in the metabolism of the sugar lactose are the other structural genes. And then the controlling regions, the promoter and the operator. That's what the operon is. Let's talk about the Y structural gene and the A structural gene. The Y structural gene in a bacterial operon, and actually in a eukaryotic operon too, codes for permease, and what that is, is the transport protein in the cell membrane that brings the sugar lactose across the cell membrane. So the Y structural gene is involved in the sugar metabolism, the sugar lactose, and it, what it does is it, it helps bring in the sugar lactose into the cell. The A gene is a gene that uh, helps convert beta-galactose, which when you cut the sugar lactose with the lactase enzyme, which is the Z gene, you get beta-galactose and glucose. Well, the A gene helps convert uh, beta galactose into the sugar glucose. The point is that all of the structural genes that are in the operon are involved in the same metabolism and in the case of the LAC operon, they're all involved in metabolizing the sugar lactose. Any question about that? Do eukaryotes have the Y gene and the A structural gene? That's a yes or no question, people. No. No. Any other guesses? Or would you like to guess again? Yes. 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 This is the correct answer. It's not in the LAC operon because in eukaryotes you only have one structural gene. But there is another operon for eukaryotes that have the Y gene and a third operon that contains the A gene. In bacteria, they're all grouped together and put into the same operon, but in eukaryotes, they are not. And they have three operons for these three structural genes. Each of them have its own controlling regions. So there are three operons for these three structural genes in eukaryotes. And what's even more complex is that in eukaryotes, these genes may be on different chromosomes. They're not together. They're not even near each other. They may be on different chromosomes. Okay? That's just the way eukaryotes are. All right, so uh, regulation of gene expression can be from induction, which means the gene is normally turned off and has to be induced to turn it on, or from repression, meaning the gene is normally expressed, but it can be shut down. And we're going to talk about induction because that is the way the lock operon works. It is an inducible operon. Normally, what happens with the lack operon is it is turned off. And that happens because there's another gene. Let me see if I've got that in the previous slide. Yep, I do. It's right here. There is another gene, which is a regulatory gene, which is not part of the lack operon. It is, in fact, another operon. And what it does is it makes a repressor protein, so it'll be transcribed and translated, making a repressor protein, which 
then binds to the operator on the LAC operon and it shuts down the expression of the LAC operon when it binds. How does it shut down the expression? When the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, it then moves down the DNA, transcribing the DNA into RNA. Well, when the polymerase runs into the operator, which is bound to the repressor protein, the polymerase stops. It can't move any further. And that shuts down the LAC operon because the LAC taste enzyme will never be transcribed while the repressor protein is bound to the operator. And that is how the D the gene is turned off. In bacteria, like E. coli, uh, this happens. Why do you think E. coli shuts down the uh, LAC operon? Why does it shut down the lactase gene? Well, nobody's hazarding a guess. What does the lact operon do? Come on, somebody should know this. What does the lac operon do? It turns on uh, lactase production? It, it uh, uh, turns on the lactase enzyme, which metabolizes the sugar lactose, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how common is the sugar lactose? Where do you find the sugar lactose? In milk? In dairy products, yes. Uh, how often would E. coli find dairy products? Probably pretty often. Uh, why do you say that? Well, I guess it could, it could grow in dairy products. Yeah, it can grow in dairy products, but we have E. coli, which can be anywhere in the world, right? How likely is E. coli going to be around a dairy product? Not very likely. Not very likely. If E. coli is on your skin, it's not going to see the sugar lactose. If it's on my table here, it's not going to see the sugar lactose. If it's in the air, it's not going to see the, the uh, sugar lactose. If it's on the ground, it's not going to see the sugar lactose. If it's on an apple on an apple tree, which are still around this time of the year, it's not going to see the sugar lactose. The only time it might see the sugar lactose is if the E. coli was on a dairy farm. And then it's only going to see the sugar lactose around, you know, milk on the dairy farm. So even on the dairy farm, E. coli isn't going to often see the sugar lactose. So that is why E. coli turns off the lac operon, because the sugar lactose is not around very much. And if it's not around, you want to turn off the gene. So normally E. coli has the LAC operon turned off because normally E. coli never sees the sugar lactose. And that would be different if the E. coli falls into milk or gets in somebody's gut who drinks milk. Like E. coli in my gut isn't going to see the sugar lactose very much because I'm lactose intolerant. But I do eat a little bit of cheese and a little bit of ice cream. 
but I never have milk, for example. Okay. So normally E. coli turns off the lac operon, and how it does it is it has a regulatory gene which makes a repressive protein which binds to the operator, turning off the lac operon. Now, with that stated, let me mention that normally the regulatory gene is not near the gene it regulates. In fact, in eukaryotes, normally the regulatory gene is on another chromosome than the gene that it's regulating. But in the case of the lac operon, the regulatory gene is right next door to the gene that it regulates. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. So that explains how the lac operon is turned off, but now we have to have a way to turn it on. And that is why it's an induced gene, that it can be turned on by an inducer. An inducer is just a molecule that turns on the gene. And in this case, it's the molecule that turns on the lac operon. The inducer for the lac operon is allolactose, which is an isomer of the sugar lactose. If you remember, lactose is a sugar, which is a stereoisomer, which is either left-handed or right-handed. I think it's left-handed, but I don't remember. And allolactose is the same sugar, but it is a opposite stereoisomer. So if, if one is left-handed, the other is right-handed. Everyone clear on that? Anyone confused about that? Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, it means that the allolactose has the same chemical composition and the same atoms as lactose and they're connected in the same way, okay? And in fact, it is the same shape, but instead of it being an exact copy, it's like a mirror image. And that's when they say one is left-handed, one is right-handed. And uh, when you look at yourself in the mirror, it's like one part of you is left-handed, the other part is right-handed. Do you understand? Yes, thank you. Okay. And that's the best I can explain it to you because I don't want to go into the chemistry. But it has to do with the three-dimensional shape of the sugar. And uh, anyways, allolactose is the inducer. Allolactose is around wherever lactose is around because all it is is a stereoisomer. And if I remember correct from my biochemistry, which I haven't had since I was in college, that uh, one stereoisomer with time will convert into the other stereoisomer. And I don't remember how that happens, but over time, one would convert into the other. The important part is, is that whenever lactose is around, allolactose is around. And so if the sugar lactose is around, allolactose is around, allolactose will bind to the repressor protein. Which, where's my mouse? There it is. It will bind to the repressor protein and then inactivate the repressor protein. If the repressor protein is inactivated, it will not bind to the operator. And if the operator doesn't have the repressor protein bound to it, the RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter, move down the operator, and then transcribe 
the Z gene making the enzyme lactase, as well as the Y gene and the A gene. Okay? Any questions about that? There is one question, but uh, let's move on and I'll get back to that question. And that is, you'll notice that in bacterial operons, that if they have more than one structural gene, they will transcribe a messenger RNA that codes for three proteins. The lactase gene, which another name for that is beta-galactosidase, I will always use the name lactase, which metabolizes the sugar lactose into glucose and beta-galactose, and then permease the other protein, which is the transport protein, which transports the sugar lactose across the cell membrane and brings it into the cell, and then uh, transacetylase, which helps convert uh, galactose into the sugar glucose. Uh, what's unusual is we don't usually think of a messenger RNA coding for more than one protein. And in eukaryotes, each messenger RNA only codes for one protein because each structural gene has its own operon. But in prokaryotes, you can have more than one structural gene in an operon, in which case there can be messenger RNAs that code for more than one protein. Any questions about that part? All right. Well, what happens to the the repressive protein that's bound to the operator? How does that get inactivated? There's two ways. All right. The allolactose cannot bind to the repressor protein when it's bound to the operator. So that way is not correct. What happens is this that repressor protein binds by a stoichiomic reaction, meaning that every once in a while it falls off. And if the repressor protein is inactivated because the allolactose is around, no repressor protein will bind to the operator and that will turn on the LAC operon. And then the repressor protein that falls off the operator will bind to allolactose so it becomes inactivated. Meaning that repressor protein doesn't bind irreversibly to the operator. It will fall off eventually. And there's something else I need to talk about. This RNA polymerase, when it's stopped by the repressor protein, it doesn't just stay there. It's binding by a stoichiomic reaction, and every once in a while it'll fall off. And once it falls off, it's then free to bind to another promoter and then transcribe that gene. If it does bind to a promoter that is blocked by a repressor protein in the operator, then it will be stopped again. But once again, every once in a while it'll fall off, and then it can become active again. Any questions about any of that? If there's no questions about that, let's watch a little video on uh, the LAC operon. Oh, shoot. Let me go to a different browser and see if it works.
probably going to be the same. Uh, sorry, they've changed this website. Let me try the third browser. Because I really don't want to register. Now, it looks like I'm going to have to register. No idea what my password is. I should just go to do is uh, Oh, for heaven's sakes. Ah, this is taking too long. Let me go to uh, YouTube and see if I can find what we're looking for. Uh, what are we looking for? Bacterial operons. One that's not too long. Let's try this one. Oops, I think I hit the wrong one. Ah, this is actually the video I wanted. The E. coli lac operon is an example of an inducible set of genes. These genes are responsible for the breakdown of lactose into sugars used for cellular metabolism. This inducible system also involves bacterial DNA, a repressor, mRNA, and the sugar molecule lactose. This animation will only focus on two of the three proteins encoded by the LAC operon, beta-galactosidase and permease. Gene expression can be induced or turned on when a specific inducer molecule appears in a cell. For inducible systems, a repressor molecule prevents gene expression by binding to the upstream controlling region. Lactose is the lac operon inducer molecule. After first appearing in the cellular environment, lactose passively enters the E. coli cell and binds to the repressor molecule. This binding releases the repressor from the controlling region. At this point, RNA polymerase can begin transcription of the operon. Here we show two of the three lac operon genes being transcribed into mRNA. Ribosomes then bind to the mRNA and the two proteins are translated. The first protein is beta-galactosidase, which breaks down lactose into two simple sugars. The second protein is permease, a membrane-bound protein. When embedded in the cell membrane, permease functions to provide a direct route for the lactose outside the cell to be imported into the cell. This import occurs at a much greater rate than the passive transfer we first observed. Because translation continues inside the cell, other permease proteins become embedded in the membrane. This further increases the rate at which lactose enters the cell. Beta-galactosidase breaks the cellular lactose into the simple sugars glucose and galactose. Once its concentration is greatly reduced, 
the lactose bound to the repressor, are released. At this point, the repressor again binds to the controlling region and gene expression is halted. For all inducible systems like the LAC operon, it is the interaction of the repressor and inducer molecules that mediate gene expression. All right, any questions about that? So regulation of gene expression can happen by induction or repression. The LAC operon is an inducible operon, and that is the gene can be, or the expression of the gene can change depending on the environment the cell is in. If the cell is in an environment that has no sugar lactose, <clears throat> the LAC operon is turned off normally because of the repressor protein. But if the cell is in an environment containing the sugar lactose, allolactose will be around, and that will bind to the repressive protein, turning on the expression of the gene. Any questions about any of that? Okay, um, let's move on then. We're going to talk briefly about mutation. Uh, mutation is a change in the genetic material, and here you're looking at a mutation. I don't know how well you can see that. Uh, mutations may be neutral to the organism. An example of a neutral mutation is about 10,000 years ago, in Northern Europe, we had a mutation in the human population creating the blue-eyed gene. Before that, humans only had brown eyes. And like I said, about 10,000 years ago, uh, that mutation happened in Northern Europe. And we know that, I don't remember how they know that, something to do with the sequencing of the DNA. Mutate, that's a neutral mutation today. It looks like people with blue-eyed genes um, have no reproductive advantage or disadvantage to brown-eyed individuals. Uh, maybe in the past, for some reason, that gave a benefit because blue eyes uh, became uh, uh, very common in Northern Europe. So maybe it was beneficial. The mutation could be beneficial. Like I said, if blue-eyed at one point in the past when we were a caveman was beneficial, it's not beneficial anymore today. And mutations can be harmful. An example of a harmful mutation would be something like sickle cell anemia. And that is this gene does not work as well as uh, the normal gene. A mutagen is an agent, chemical or physical, that increases the rate of a mutation. So a mutagen is something that, or an agent, that causes a mutation. X-rays are a mutagen. Uh, ionizing radiation is a mutagen. Tobacco smoke is a mutagen. I don't remember what it is in tobacco smoke, but it's a mutagen. Uh, benzene is a chemical mutagen, and it increases an error in the DNA. Now, you might have noticed I said increases the error in the DNA. There are always spontaneous mutations, mutations that occur in the absence of a mutagen. And when the DNA is being replicated, mistakes are made, and they're very rare, but these we call spontaneous mutations. Any question about any of that? A mutagen simply increases the rate of mutation. 
So we always have mutation. The different types of mutations you'll talk about in the discussion for this lab. So it's on the second worksheet for this lab. The frequency of a spontaneous mutation is it happens once when every 10 to the 9th base is replicated. So meaning when a DNA polymerase is replicating bases, it makes a mistake one time in 10 to the 9th replicated bases. So not very often, but uh, we have more than 10 to the 9th uh, bases in our genome. Since each gene has about a thousand bases in it, that means the chance of a spontaneous mutation in a replicated gene is about one in 10 to the six or one in a million. Mutations increase the mutation rate and it can increase it from one in 10 to the six replicated genes to one in 10 to the fifth or one uh, in a thousand, one in 10 to the three, meaning it's increasing the mutation rate by 10 to a thousand fold. Any questions about that? All right, if there's no questions about that, I think I'm going to stop here and I will continue with this uh, next Tuesday. If there's no questions, I will see you in the lab. I'm just going to be there for questions. If there's no questions, I will end the lab at 645, but I will be there from 630 to 645. And if there are questions, I will stay in the lab until the last question is answered. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Thank you. you.